Dems keep winning and the margin for Speaker Moses Johnson keeps getting smaller. House Republicans were for a border bill before they were against it, but now they are totally for it again. Even the White House is saying, make it make sense. If at first you don't succeed in impeaching an obscure cabinet secretary for the first time in 150 years, try, try again before you lose yet another seat to the Democrats. Sure, one guy is a monster that wants to destroy NATO, let Russia invade Europe and dismantle the government, but at least he is four years younger than the other guy. A whole bunch of editorializing in a report that exonerates President Biden sure feels like a flashback to 2016, probably because it is. Our Chiefs won the Super Bowl again. I can say our because Ravi's not with us this week. Uh, our Chiefs won the Super Bowl again, even after Taylor Swift clearly sabotaged the whole season. We were told many times, well, that's three Super Bowls in the last five years and counting. Welcome back to the podcast for the 54% of Americans who vote for progress in every election and want to convince their conservative friends and family members to join our majority. This is Majority 54. Ravi is, Ravi is in India for a reporting project, so I'm joined by my friend and fellow Army veteran Fred Wellman, the host of On Democracy with F.P. Wellman, right here on Friday nights on the Midas Touch Network. Hey, it's great to be here. Talk thank you for show. having me, man. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank you for being on here with me. Uh, all right, man, you get to do the Ravi thing and tell us what's going on. <laughs> Debs keep winning. I mean, I mean, we, we're, we're coming off a great night last, last night, right? Uh, there was some polls that was a lot closer than it was. You know, uh, uh, Mr. Swazi was supposed to supposed to be like a one or two point margin, and and they they won. And the special election goes to Dems, further making that majority that they had even smaller than it was. Uh, I think that's why we, we'll talk about some of the other things they did because of that. But but I think that's the story, right? It we just keep seeing. I mean, on in addition, yesterday you may not have heard uh, there was a special election in Pennsylvania uh, for uh, open. A state house seat dems won that giving them a 102 to 100 margin defending a seat and and it's like my friend uh in a time roseberg always says you know we just keep winning you can talk polls all you want but for the democrats are showing that they can have the turnout they have the right messaging and, and it's also working so uh he i think i think he won what was it 7.5 points eight point win last night which is <laughs> yeah i mean that's that's mm -hmm. a solid win and what was funny is you woke up today and they're already blaming you know, I mean, they're they're already saying it was somebody else's fault. You know, it's just they, they're making excuses on the realities. But I mean, what do you think, James? I mean, what does it say about their message? I mean, because they were talking border, 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 and I don't. It didn't seem to work, did it? Well, yeah. Um, it does seem like, and and I know we have a clip we'll go through in a second that sort of yeah. teased this up, but that that it was sort of the standard midterm lack of substance thing where when they don't have much to say, they just talk about brown people. Um, and I'm not saying that there aren't issues at the border. I'm not saying that right. particularly in New York, that there aren't major yeah. migrant issues. Um, but they really leaned on that hard uh, and it, it really didn't work out for them. So with that, let's go ahead and, and speaking of Simon Rosenberg, let's let's throw to that clip yeah. from MSNBC. The, if you lived through this campaign in New York, your television was bombarded with yes. the Democratic ads, the, the Swazi campaign ads which were about abortion rights and preserving abortion rights. And then the Republican ads were all about the southern border. Those two issues went to war on television yep. in big budget campaigns. And one of those issues won big. It's another warning sign for a party that is broken, broken right now, the Republican Party, because you know, so what we know from history is Simon that Rosenberg. the issue of immigration and the border never rises up to a top tier issue. They don't win elect general elections on immigration, and the border. They may win primary races. If you remember in 2018, Trump spent the last month of the 2018 midterm cycle talking about the caravans and the invasion at the border. And we won that election by eight and a half points. And that's because for most voters, there are just things that matter more than the border and immigration. It doesn't mean they're not important. It's just that the economy, health care, abortion rights, reproductive rights, other things matter more. And when Republicans are tr have historically tried to turn immigration into a general election issue, they've repeatedly failed. And I think the Republicans, I just can, if I can say one more thing really quickly, is that I think the danger now for the Republican Party is that all these talking points they have about Biden and the Democrats have evaporated in the last couple of months. The economy is strong. We're not in recession. Inflation is way down. Crime is way down all across the country. We're not going through a crime wave in the United States. There is no war on energy. We produce more domestic renewables and oil than any year in history. And the one area where they still retained an advantage was on border and immigration. They lost on it tonight. 
and they also grossly mismanaged the issue and handed it to us last week. All of their advantages on all the major issues are evaporating right now, and they're in a lot of trouble, I think, in 2024. So the first thing that pops up to me, pops out to me about this, Fred, is that um, what I think we should be, what should guard our optimism a little is that I do think that the Republicans ate it really hard on immigration just in the week prior to this special election. Yeah. Um, Right. I mean, because, you know, they have they had this this bill, bill, this bipartisan bill that everybody thought was pretty legit. And then they just looked like fools. And I yep. think that, and that's not going to happen probably right before the next election. I mean, that might be something new. I mean, I go back to, if you look at Virginia, Virginia, the big, they thought they really had it figured out with the Virginia election just last November. You know, uh, Young was running around saying, we've got the formula for, abor- we're going to beat them on abortion. It's 15 months for, or 15 weeks. This is going to be it. And then re- voters rejected it. They retook the Senate or they kept the Senate. They, re- they flipped the House there. That wasn't the message. Now they thought, well, okay, this election is going to be, it's a border, the border, border, border. Well, then they refused to accept a bipartisan bill that had been engineered by their own members uh and they flipped that and that fell on their face that message and and the thing about we, we got to talk about too jason is swazi went hard at board he he showed up at like one of uh, one of his opponents like press conferences and asked her a hard question like would you have voted for the bill why did you vote against it the interesting thing they've done is they've presented an opportunity for democrats to say but we're working on it and you refuse to do so. So it is going to be a messaging. And look, I always say, you know, if you've ever seen me talk, I always say the same thing about polls and about elections. You're 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 an elected official. <laughs> you know, I'm a campaign hack. Whenever somebody says to me, well, if the election was held tomorrow, I always say, well, but it's not. Right? <laughs> I mean, it's February, yeah, yeah. right? You know what I right. mean? Like a lot can happen in politics, right? I mean, it, you know, so, but, you know, it, we are in a role. It's, but we've also been saying, oh, be cautious, be cautious. But we're winning elections. And I guess that counts for a lot, right? Well, it's also like if the election were held tomorrow, that would be weird because we've been preparing for the election to be held in November, which is why we've been <laughs> messaging the way we have. Right. But, exactly. Um, yeah. But, you know, the other thing I think about this, about the immigration issue that hopefully remains the case in November is that, you know, we always talk about how difficult it is for the opposing party to win when the economy is trending upward. But I think it is particularly difficult to get traction on the immigration issue when the economy is trending upward because you know the heart of like at the heart of really making that issue move persuadable voters i think is having someone to blame a bad economy on and that means you got to have a bad economy in the first place to get to create that anxiety that'll give people a scapegoat and when the economy when people feel like it's turning in the right direction i it's not that they necessarily change their views on immigration. It just seems like maybe they, they don't prioritize that issue quite as quite as high. Right. That's exactly it. it. It's just it's a very nebulous issue because as much as a lot of people want to say it affects them, you know, you, I live in St. Louis, you live outside Kansas City. It doesn't affect me. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, it just doesn't. I live in. I, hold on. I live in Kansas City. I want to be. I want to be clear. Sorry. sorry about that. I, I don't want. I'm a, I'm, I don't want. I'm a it's suburb okay. guy. I, <laughs> I don't. I don't want people thinking I've moved to the suburbs. But go. go we don't ahead. want that. Keep no, going. we can't have that. I, I forgot you're right. You know. So, but having said that, it doesn't affect me on a daily basis. Going to get gas does. Um, going to get eggs when they were double the price last year, they are now. That does affect me. There, there's certain. There comes a certain point. I think where the daily life of an average American denies the lies they're being told right so it's like okay mm-hmm. they're going to keep telling us this is huge it's big but as much as they want to pound the issue it's not affecting them and the thing i say a lot and going back to the abortion issue uh before we move on to the <laughs> lack of just the dysfunction on their side too which is another issue i, I say it a lot i did a whole piece on it a while ago women aren't forgetting like a, no. you're, a woman cannot forget that her rights were taken away. It, it, there, there was that, you know, the political punditry class, which I guess we're, we may be part of now, <laughs> says, well, you know, and I'm a campaign hack, like I told you, and the campaign hack rule is you do all the really tough stuff early in the administration or early in the term. So f- voters have two years to forget or four years to forget what you did, right? Women are never given the opportunity to forget that their rights for an abortion are taken away. Here in Missouri, where you know the Senate just voted down a, 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 a carve out for abortion, a rape and incest, they decided not to push that. One of the guy running for governor said, because this would allow one-year-olds to get abortions. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I assure you, women aren't going to forget that. And yeah. so I, I do think there's issues like you're right that will go away. The border dysfunction will go away. But the big issues that we're running on that are that are really bipartisan issues. Uh, an article came out just today, I think, in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch saying even the majority of Missourians 
Missourians believe women should have mm -hmm. some form of a right to abortion. So, so I, I gotta tell you, man, I think as much as the, the pundry might say it's a while to the election, the issues that matter are affecting people on a daily basis, both good and bad for those who are on the progressive side. But, and then that of course goes to the defunction. I mean, we, then we go into, I think we have a clip coming up, right? Salty about mm -hmm. how the reporters were there on the ground in New York talking to actual voters and the answers they got, I think Dana Basher actually seemed surprised by what she heard. I mean, do you have that clip Salty? I heard from voters that they were very, now these are obviously, um, very well-informed voters, right. but they were they were at the polling station. They were voting early, and several of them said to me that they don't uh, want to vote for the Republican because it's clearly impossible to get a solution on the issue of immigration. They said border, uh, the border problem, the immigration issue, uh, the migrant issue in their district was the top issue for them, and that the fact that Republicans killed that bipartisan deal. Uh, put them over the edge to vote for Tom Swazi, and immigration was their top issue. So I think that there's some. So I thought that was really interesting because that that to me is the argument that this could potentially be a point in time because the legislative procedural bit of this will be unfortunately somewhat forgotten in several months. But let's go to that other clip that we have in that spot uh, that is saying something similar but different. Yeah. You're looking for trend lines ahead of November, and you're hoping to hold on to what is a swing district for yourself as well. Obviously, I talked to two voters today who voted for Donald Trump in 2016, turned around and voted for the Democrats in this race, voted for Tom Suozzi because they said his message on bipartisanship and the fact that House Republicans have really struggled to pass legislation over the last couple of weeks impacted the way they were looking at this race. And if you're a Democrat running in these swing districts, running in a suburban district, that's the kind of message, that's the kind of playbook that you want to emulate in November. So obviously. So what's interesting to me about that, Fred, is that like one, I think some of that is repeatable in legislative elections, like if this were a midterm. Yeah. What I worry about is how repeatable that is, because those voters who vote for Trump, they may have. And look, there's not that many of them, but there's enough that they say, well, strategically, what I want right now, I'm mad at the Republicans in Congress. Heck, they might be mad at the Republicans in Congress because they didn't go far enough or whatever. But either right. way, they're mad. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean to me that they won't vote for Trump. So yeah. we still have more work to do, I guess, is my point. Yeah, no, you're right. And that's that's the theme here, isn't it? It's it's and I always say that everybody like, well, I am um, cautious. <laughs> it's you know, I was a spokesman for general. So I had to say things like we're cautiously optimistic and we've turned a corner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? But I am cautiously optimistic that, yeah, we have we are on the trend line. But how do you I, I say, you know, you maybe you want a battle, but the war still has to be fought. And so we can't sit All on right. laurels and those who are in the fight have to keep fighting. Of course, Trump. Trump's being Trump too, you know. <laughs> I mean, yeah. He, so there's that, you know, the obliviousness is still re re remains, you know. Yeah, let's let's look at his statement here. His statement when uh, Swazi <laughs> lost, Swazi won. Uh, of course, everyone probably already knows at this point that this is in all caps. Uh, he said, <laughs> uh, "MAGA, which is most of the Republican st Party, stayed home, and it always will unless it is treated with the respect that it deserves." I stayed out of the race. Uh, I guess he said, I want to be loved. Give us a real in candidate quotations. in the district. For the, yeah, he put that in. Oh, that's in quotations. He's trying to say. So he's weird. like trying to say it without having credit for saying it. He's like putting it in. I guess it's like air quotes. He says, give us a real candidate in the district for November. Swazi, I know him well, can be easily beaten. Um, all right. So with that, let's go to the way uh, that Speaker Johnson um, reacted when they brought this up. The concept of whether the border bill affected this race. Handle this issue and effectively give Democrats something to campaign on. No, not at all. Look, the American people are with us on this issue. I mean, they are with us because they understand you have to actually solve the problem. And the product that was produced by the Senate did not solve the problem. You've all heard us hammer over and over HR2, right? That was our signature piece of legislation that we passed many, many months ago, last year. And, and the reason that all those components are important, again, is because they, they have to fit together. That's got to solve the problem. You have to address all of them. The Senate bill didn't do that, and that's why it was rejected. So it's crafty because what he's trying to do is he's just trying to take our message and use it. He's saying, yeah. well, the reason that people are upset is because the problem didn't get solved. And the reason we couldn't take the Senate bill is because it didn't solve the problem. But the, 
so far, people seem to have figured out that the Senate bill went a lot farther to solving the problem than any, anything else has. And I think people kind of get, or at least enough people kind of get, that the House Republicans chose to have the issue instead of the bill. Yeah. And I just think if we're going to have people know that in November, we're going to have to, it's going to have to be like our only response to the issue, right? Right. That, that's it. I mean, that is it. We, we, we gave them what they wanted, which was Swazi. So we have to keep saying it. Obviously, we're a long way. I don't know if you saw today, the news came out that, that actually DHS and Border Patrol actually having to look at, they may have to release thousands of detainees right now because they don't have enough money to keep them on hold because this bill didn't pass. Well, I mean, that's kind of what the Republicans wanted, right? They wanted to create chaos and, and they'll get video of thousands of migrants being released. So, so in a lot that's of ways- true. Their destruction leads to the most. They want the chaos, right? They 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 want chaos. That's why they're doing what they're doing. And unfortunately, they'll do a very good job of spinning said chaos. You know, it's like we talk about schools, right? We cut the budget of school. Schools start failing. They go, well, look at this. The schools are failing. <laughs> well, yeah, right. you know, chicken egg. And so you're right. It, the nuance of that may fall on deaf ears, and that's something to be a little bit nervous about. There's no question about it. Well, yeah, because you know, it, as much as you can work to have to have people understand why something happened, it is simply a harder argument to say that yeah. what's going on at the border is the fault of one house of Congress and not, you know, not the fault of the president, because even, even if, even if there is a good argument, and I think there is that a lot of a difference could have been made if, if the GOP house had moved, it's just a, it's just, you, there's a, what's that expression in politics when you're explaining you're losing and there's a lot yeah. of explaining to do in making that argument. And so it's just gotta be, this is why last week what I was saying was is that it may need to be as simple as Biden being able to answer everything with, I asked them to let me close the border and they said no, because they wanted Trump to be able to complain about the border. And, yeah. you know, like, and it's got to be like the only thing he says about it between now and then. But um, all right. Their response to this has been to impeach Mayorkas. Now, yeah. how, how did they go ahead and do this? <laughs> <laughs> because one Dem was out for COVID and they were losing an election that night. I mean, they, they, you know, last week they had, we had to wheel one guy in in a wheelchair. Uh, this week, one member was out for COVID and Scalise was back. So they won by one single vote, you know, one huh. single vote, you know, it's just, you know, and again, what's the goal here? And they were triumphant. You should, I don't know if you saw the video, like Bobert coming out. We need to, we need to show it, you know, Bobert like I'm working for the American people by impeaching by Orcus. And I saw one just before we went on the air, with uh, Raji Manu, I think, uh, from, or uh, he caught somebody in the hallway, a, a congressman. He said, so congressman, how does this fix the border? He goes, who said anything about fixing the border? <laughs> it was just like, right. it was like, okay. <laughs> you know, that, it's really not the goal. <laughs> right, right. He's like, what do you think this is, Congress? Right. <laughs> We're not trying to help anything, you know. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm always reminded that old, remember that old uh, what was it, the old uh, IBM commercial? And the guy sitting across from the two consultants. And he's like, oh, I love this plan. Let's do it. And he's like, oh, well, uh, we don't actually do it. We just <laughs> we don't actually do things. We just talk about them, you know, and that's that's the right. Republicans. They actually fix anything, you know. So, uh, you know, but they, they, the, of course, this is the battle now with the aid package. And it all kind of goes together. The, the impeachment, the aid package fighting and all. I mean, it is it's this dysfunction. And the only thing they're able to accomplish is throwing Marjorie Taylor Greene a bone on, on impeaching my orcas, which, and the funniest thing, I mean, look, we cannot avoid the comedy. We have to admit the comedy of Marjorie Taylor Greene being one of the impeachment managers in the Senate. I think Schumer said they're going to do the do the trial like at the end of the month when they come back. I mean, it's going to. We have what Dan That's Goldman true. and <laughs> you know, so so yeah. it's going to be great having you know they're not even putting lawyers on this thing. It's going to be comedy, but you know, you and I are professionals too. We're American citizens first out here in the Midwest. And yeah, the comedy is great for us pundits, but it, what does it mean? It means aid packages for our, you, know, you and I both served overseas. We know Ukrainian soldiers run on ammunition right now. Um, we know our Israelis, you know, are fighting, you know, a war. The, in that package is aid for Gaza too. If you, if you want aid for Gaza, aid for Gaza is in that package, and all that's mm -hmm. being stopped after a bipartisan vote uh, in in the Senate and the House, just basically, you know, doing their little game of oh, but we want border first. Like, well, you had border. Oh yeah, but now we want it. It's it's just a, it's a very sad game. And you could tell you could tell that Mr. Biden's getting sick of it. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean. In fact, I think, did we end up with a supercut of the Biden speech, Salty? If so, go ahead and play it. If not, I'll just go ahead and keep talking. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Okay. I have to say that. So we'll yeah, we're, first. okay. So yes, we're we're gonna have it, but we're gonna have it right after the ad. So so that's a good a good uh, lead into it. So we're gonna go take a little break uh, for and our sponsors. We'll we'll talk at you. I guess we'll talk at you about our sponsors, um, and then we'll come back. We'll look at Biden's response to this, and then we'll keep going with all the topics that we mentioned at the top, from you know the regular Trump legal stuff going on, the RNC takeover, NATO, and uh, and you know the way. Trump's talking about NATO the way he's talking about Nikki Haley's husband, which weirdly are kind of one topic, uh, but we'll get all that when we come back. (laughs) This episode is sponsored by Roan. If you're like me, you understand the pains of finding what to wear. Most clothes are uncomfortable. They may be too tight. They never, you know, actually fit your size because, you know, a lot of us are not exactly small, medium, large, extra large. We're complicated. Sometimes when you find something you like, you can only wear it for a few hours before that important meeting or dinner, and then you have to change into something else. And everyone wants to dress their best. You want to look good at all times. And frankly, it's a confidence booster. So here's the deal. Men's closets were due for a radical reinvention and Roan stepped up to the challenge. Roan's commuter collection is the most comfortable, breathable, and flexible set of products known to man, and here's why. Roan helps you get ready for any occasion with the commuter collection, which offers the world's most comfortable pants, dress shirts, quarter zips, and polos. You never have to worry about what to wear when you have the Roan commuter collection. And here's some anecdote. I'm wearing my Roan pants right now. And last week I was at a wedding. I wore my Roan uh, button-down shirt to the wedding at a formal wedding and i will also wear it tomorrow when i just you know go into a coffee shop to have a meeting it's that versatile so it's time to feel confident without the hassle with roan's wrinkle release technology wrinkles disappear as you stretch and wear the products it's that easy yeah i actually you know not so neatly folded that shirt in my bag for the wedding and i was able to take it out and Automatically, I was able to put it on. It looked like I had ironed it, but I didn't. You know, it's an inside secret between us. So with Gold Fusion anti-odor technology, you'll also be smelling fresh and clean all day on top of that. Roan is 100% machine washable, so you can dish the dry cleaner all together. We're on the move a lot, and the Roan commuter collection has never let me down. The versatility and overall comfort of the collection is undefeated. I absolutely love it. And even after I wear it all day, I feel super fresh because that Gold Fusion fusion anti-odor technology at that wedding i was dancing up a storm wore it no problems so the commuter collection can get you through any work day and straight into whatever comes next so head to roan.com slash majority and use the promo code majority to save 20 percent off your entire order that's 20 percent off your entire order when you head to roan.com slash majority and use the code majority it's time to find your corner office comfort sleep is incredibly important in my household which is why i love my helix mattress so much now here's the order uh, in, you know, it's like my family, you know, Diana, true Bella. And then right into that, I, I, Oh, the dog, no, the dog is after the dog is after my mattress. So like in terms of what I'm, I'm on the road right now, what, I'm, what I'm looking forward to when I get home, I want to see my family. And then I want to sleep on my mattress that I love. And then I would like to see my dog. Now I'm going to see my dog before the mattress, but you get my point. Uh, and that's because I, you know, I'm a guy who like, I used to be such a pro at sleeping on any surface. I was a soldier. Uh, you know, like I prided myself on that. I could sleep anywhere. But now I'm totally spoiled, man. Like I dread this hotel bed that I'm looking at over here because I, I just miss my mattress. It just knows exactly what to do with my spine. It's perfect. So with everything going, everything going on in life, from work to a demanding social schedule to sports and kids and kids sports, it's incredibly important to me and probably to you that you're getting a good night's sleep every single night. So you should take the Helix Sleep Quiz and find your perfect mattress in under two minutes. Uh, I took the Helix Sleep Quiz. I was matched with uh, a Midnight Lux mattress because I wanted something that felt like medium uh, medium to firm and, and I sleep on my side. So it really helped me uh, get exactly where I needed to be. Don't take my word for it. Helix Sleep has over 12,000 five-star reviews. So by supporting Helix, you're allowing them to support this show. Go purchase your Helix and thank us later for your best night's sleep. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash majority54. This is their best offer yet, and it won't last long with Helix. Better sleep starts now. We're back. <laughs> okay, yeah, go ahead. Hit, no, hit we're coming out. Yeah, 
yeah, let's so like you know we're both veterans. I you and I have talked separately. I think we were texting each other about you know this crazy stuff. It, it's weird to see Nate and Nash's career taking a well. Thanks to Mr. Trump, being Mr. Trump, doing what he does best. Um, he set off the a lot of issues. As, as so, for context, guys, we come out of the clip out, out of our commercial. Obviously, this, there's a Ukraine bill, there's an Israel bill. The, the Senate worked hard. Seventy-two senators, I think, passed it. Uh, terrific, a terrific bill. Um, Ninety-five billion dollars includes Ukraine aid, much needed. They're running out of ammo. Includes Israeli aid. Includes aid for Gaza. Um, the House Speaker's taught and to ignore it. Mr. Biden rolled, you know, Biden rolled in pretty forcefully on this whole issue. And then also, you'll see some context that we'll go into afterwards about something Trump said that. Well, you don't want to miss it. But let's do the Biden first. It's un-American. When America gives us word, it means something. When we make a commitment, we keep it. And NATO is a sacred commitment. Donald Trump looks at this as if it's a burden. When he looks at NATO, he doesn't see the alliance that protects America and the world. He sees a protection racket. He doesn't understand that NATO is built on the fundamental principles of freedom, security, and national sovereignty. Because for Trump, Principles never matter. Everything is transactional. He doesn't understand that the sacred commitment we've given works for us as well. In fact, I would remind Trump and all those who would walk away from NATO, Article 5 has only been invoked once, just once in our NATO history, and it was done to stand with America after we were attacked on 9-11. We should never forget it. The stakes are already high for American security before this bill was passed in the Senate last night. But in recent days, those stakes have risen. And that's because the former president has sent a dangerous and shockingly, frankly, un-American signal to the world. Just a few days ago, Trump gave an invitation to Putin to invade some of our allies, NATO allies. He said if an ally didn't spend enough money on defense, he would encourage Russia to, quote, do whatever the hell they want, end of quote. Can you imagine a former president of the United States saying that? The whole world heard it. The worst thing is he means it. No other president in our history has ever bowed down to a Russian dictator. Well, let me say this as clearly as I can. I never will. For God's sake, it's dumb, it's shameful, it's dangerous, it's un-American. When America gives us word, it means something. When we make a commitment, we keep it. And NATO is a sacred commitment. You know, our adversaries have long sought to create cracks in the alliance. The greatest hope of all those who wish America harm is for NATO to fall apart. And you can be sure that they all cheered when they heard Donald Trump and heard what he said. I know this. I will not walk away. I can't imagine any other president walking away. For as long as I'm president, if Putin attacks a NATO ally, the United States will defend every inch of NATO territory. Wow. Yeah. So what has you know? Obviously, he's a little ahead. Of, we put Mr. Biden first, but I kind of wanted to tee that up that way um, to see the passion that Biden showed on this. And and for those who missed it, let's go back and see what Trump. And and look, here's the thing: you guys have to keep in mind. I'll just forward to you at this tape. Okay. NATO is not a protection racket, <laughs> right? I mean, I don't know why he doesn't get it, Chase. It's been years. He he thinks there's like they're like dues paying members, like it's a club of it. It's like the effing Mar a Lago. It, NATO is not Mar a Lago. The requirement is that they spend two percent of their budget, and that's it. There's no you got to pay due. He acts like they owe us money somehow, and and this is how things like that come out. So, Salty, let's let's run what set Mr. Biden off so forcefully. They asked me that question. One of the presidents of a big country stood up and said, well, sir, uh, if we don't pay and we're attacked by Russia, will you protect us? I said, you didn't pay? You're delinquent? He said, yes, let's say that happened. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. You got to pay. You got to pay your bills. First of all, it's... Obviously ironic as hell for that guy to lecture people about paying their bills, but we're way past that. <laughs> Americans don't really care about that anymore. There's they, that. They, they wouldn't need to be persuaded if they cared. Um, look, it's important for people to know, because not everybody watching or listening to yeah. this knows, um, NATO is not something that just came along. NATO is a big part of why the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, you know, NATO, NATO has been there a while, right? Th these alliances are why 
the Soviet Union uh, or now Russia is deterred from doing things even worse than invading Ukraine. It's why we can be confident that they won't keep rolling into Poland, right? Reasonably confident. And it's why that if they if they did, um, Poland can be confident that we'd have their backs, but it's ultimately why they won't because they know that we will have their backs. But at the same time, NATO has played an enormous role as a transatlantic alliance. I mean, look, I I served under NATO in Afghanistan. People don't even realize that, that that wasn't like a UN force. It was also not Iraq, right? It wasn't just a US-led coalition. It was a NATO coalition. Um, like I had one of, one of my optional combat patches was a NATO patch. They called it ISAF. It was the International Security Assistance Force, but it was just NATO. That's all it was. So yep. it has enormous benefits for the United States of America that go well beyond like how much people are paying. Also, what a Republican ass thing to say that different countries of different sizes all have to pay the same. No, some countries are smaller. They're not going to pay as much. A lot of them don't have as large of a military. They may not even make their 2% thing, but it doesn't mean that it's not in our major national interest uh, for this to happen. Um, so, yes, it's completely ridiculous. And I'm passionate about it too, because though NATO didn't participate as a country in Iraq, NATO countries participated, did, did submit right. those troops. And you really you made me think of it when you talk about those small countries. Some of the, I, I, so I served at Minsticky, which, oh my God, what a name. So, multinational security transition. <laughs> it, it's just a long, but what we were doing is training the Iraqi security forces. And part of that, many of those international countries, like Germany, Georgia, smaller countries, they don't have the big fighting force. So they participated, they, they gave us troops to train Iraqis, small contingency. I traveled the country with the C you know, General Petraeus, General Dempsey, visiting these, like you said, these small Lithuania, just tiny countries Lithuania, had hardcore yeah. training, you know, training. They, they, when we needed help, they mm -hmm. came, you know, yeah. our word is our bond. And that's what I think sets me off so much is knowing our peers in these countries who have, who've stepped up, by the way, to include Ukraine, <laughs> you know, to include mm -hmm, Ukrainians yeah. uh, who were fierce warriors overseas. Um, then to say things like that, like, well, you know, pay up and Russia can have their way. It, it is, I think for me as an old combat vet, it really kind of, it, it ever sets me, but you know, but you know, not to be outdone, <laughs> you know, you can't just stop attacking NATO. He also has to attack the military because that's what he does. So in, in his efforts, he turned right around in his efforts to smear Nikki Haley. Uh, do we have that clip salty of uh, what he said about Nikki Haley? Over the weekend, Donald Trump questioned the whereabouts of Nikki Haley's husband, who's serving a year-long deployment in Africa for the South Carolina Army National Guard. Where's her husband? Oh, he's away. He's away. Where, what happened to her husband? What happened to her husband? Where is he? He's gone. You know, to mock my husband, Michael and I can handle that. But you mock one member of the military, you mock all members of the military. But the reality is he's talked about the military for years now, in, in disparaging ways. Suckers, losers, John McCain, gold star families. What's different now? What's different this time? Before, when he did it, it was during the 2016 election. Everybody thought, oh, did he have a slip? What, what did that mean? The problem now is he is not the same person he was in 2016. He is unhinged. He is more diminished than he, than he was. Uh, look. I'm going to go ahead and read <laughs> read Trump's mind a little bit on this. And one, I think, look, I think a few things here. I think Trump, A, doesn't understand that when the army tells you to go somewhere, you go. B, right. even if he does understand, he doesn't care or believe it because he can't imagine that no. somebody, particularly somebody whose wife is in a privileged position, who, you know, assume, you know, presumably comes from a high status in whatever their civilian career is. I'm sure he cannot imagine the concept of you received a deployment order and you can't just say no. Um, now, I guess he could if he were going to resign his commission. Um, but but so that's, I, you know, look, it's not it's revealing just... about Trump's character at this point. It's just no. re-illuminating. Um, but uh, God, Look, I, I'm not. I don't have a great deal of sympathy for Nikki Haley or her. You know, I, I maybe I do for her husband. I don't know him, but maybe. boy, she's showing a lot of restraint. I would be like so pissed. Yeah.
Yeah. But I, 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 mean, I, I you know me, I, I beat her up still though, because if you, if you caught yeah. that question he asked at the end, he's like, well, he's done this before. He says before. And her, I kind of got, yeah. I was kind of, you know, I'm glad she's beating up on her now. It's lovely she found yeah. her. But let's be honest, she's mad because it's her family this time. Like, you know, I'm, right. I'm very close friends with Alex and Rachel Vim. And Rachel, Rachel especially has become like a sister to me. You know, I mean, really, I, I think I, I text her as much mm -hmm. as my girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, you know, we were like, mm -hmm. we're like blood. We're like family, right? You know, and, and where was she? For, the, for those who didn't hear that fully, you're talking about Lieutenant Colonel Alex Vindman and his wife, Rachel, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, who was uh, the kind of the star witness in the impeachment inquiry, yep. uh, who was then railroaded out of the military and, and defamed yep. by Trump. Yep. And his brother. Go ahead. Go ahead. Got... Yeah, no, good. And so I met them. I, knew, I actually knew them before and we've become close since. And I actually did an ad with them when I was the Lincoln Project, you know, focused mm -hmm. on Rachel. We're the most powerful man in the world attacked a military family so for nikki to come in and say oh well that was during the 2016 election oh sister no 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 he was the commander-in-chief yeah. and he ended up facing an impeachment after attacking this family and he did it right on tv during a press conference where he specifically said horrible things about serving lieutenant colonel in the united states army so so while i do have sympathy for it, and i'm glad she's standing up at this point it's also hard for me to feel you know shed even a, a single like salty tear <laughs> when she served on, she was serving as u.n secretary or u.n ambassador when he did that right that was when she was yeah. a part of his administration and it didn't bother her one bit when someone else's husband slash lieutenant colonel was being attacked so you know that's, I guess, that's trump right that's that's you know eventually it's going to come to you there's no one safe eventually from his ire right i mean that's just but, how it that's is. a good point and listen look at her answer she didn't say yeah he's been like this a long time we thought maybe he was kidding now we know he's not no what she said was uh she said well you know he said that in the past but the the thing is now he's not the same person anymore she's trying to pivot back to what right. is her central campaign message of the moment which is basically He's old. He's lost. He's lost yeah. velocity on his fastball, and that's why you should pick me. So even even when you know confronted with this, she just sort of pivots back to that, which I guess is probably the advice she's getting. Um, but look, you know who I feel bad for in this deal, obviously, is Nikki Haley's husband, because yeah. Nikki Haley's husband was only able to you know sort of surreptitiously, um, like implicitly reply. Like he he posted like yeah. a picture of a wolf, that, a meme that said something like. You know the difference between humans and animals is that animals would never follow the dumbest person and the, the dumbest member of the pack um, <laughs> but he had that. you know you and i know he's on probably year-long federal orders oh, he can't say a word. so so he can't you know all he can do is like cryptically post a meme which is mm -hmm. probably pretty uh, aggravating and he's all the way over there and yeah. i assume he i don't know he's probably a Djibouti because that's where yeah. a lot of these um you know deployments go and it's probably rather isolating and you know so also look i mean just to really humanize this even deeper um he's in the south carolina national guard he might even be hearing some people say pro-trump stuff occasionally oh yeah you know? no like, doubt about it it's probably really aggravating for a guy who's just trying to do his job and uh, yeah. so that just sucks um, say what you will he's serving his country he stepped up to volunteer absolutely and, and you can those are sometimes like a volunteer ish deployment right like the name your name comes yeah. down but you can volunteer like my last two iraq tours were volunteer <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, i just love quotes. i love the food i love kebab but yeah uh, yeah yeah you know, that's it <laughs> i just kept going back for the food but you no know, but again he is stepping up and i'll always honor that and respect that he's done a very good job of staying professional and that's not always the case you're like well it's tulsi gabbard you know it, it's it's he has right. made carefully being a professional maintaining the fact that though he might be able to say things when he's not in the uniform he has been he's always i've never seen a single inkling that he would so to, kudos to him and and for that and i and again i yeah. always uh, she is a blue star family i mean we have to give them credit you know interesting fact just going back to that um for those who don't understand what when i say blue star family a blue star family member is someone who has a family member serving in the united states military who's alive have you ever heard probably the, the term gold star family that's someone when you've had a family member who's passed away while in service but he's a blue star family and a fun fact that came out during the 2020 campaign was that president biden is the first president we've had since eisenhower who's known what it's like to send a child to war He's the first mm -hmm. like truly blue star family we've had in the White House since Eisenhower. And I think that affects things. I think they understand the life and and I'll give I will give um you know Nikki Haley credit because she she does understand what it's like to stand there on that tarmac, you know, watching them take off. And look, even at peacetime, people die. I mean, mm -hmm. even in a non-combat, I do air quotes if you're not if you're listening, non-combat tour, 
people die. We, we just lost an aircraft with five United States Marine Corps, uh, young, young, God, I don't know if you saw their faces, young men, five very young men, their, their early 20s all perished in a helicopter crash in California on a training mission, nothing more than flying a helicopter cross country. So, so I'll give kudos to any Blue Star family who's, who understands that risk. So. I think it's probably a big place to break for now. And I think we have another. No, no, no. And well, before we do, I, I'll, I'll add to it real quick and just say that, um, you know, Trump may be, I think what he's trying to get away with and what he may get away with in South Carolina is having people think, well, he volunteered. And the thing about that is, is like, even if he did, it's because this dude has a career too. And yep. this is part of that career. And it was probably yep. planned for a long time. And so yeah. um, the whole thing is just disgusting. And we're going to, Go. We're going to talk in just a moment after this ad break. We're going to talk about this RNC takeover and the, and some Trump legal stuff. But this should be yet another reminder of how this and the NATO comments, like how seriously dangerous it would be uh, to have this this terrible, terrible person win again. So, with that uplifting thought, let's go to a quick break and then we'll come back. <laughs> Did you know Fast Growing Trees is the biggest online nursery in the U.S. with more than 10,000 different kinds of plants and over 2 million happy customers in the U.S.? You can grow lemon, avocado, olive, or fig trees inside your home on top of the wide variety of houseplants available. Fast Growing Trees makes it easy to order online and your plants are shipped directly to your door in one to two days. And along with their 30-day Alive and Thrive guarantee, they offer free plant consultation forever. I love fast growing trees. I recently got their most popular small avocado tree at a great price. They have an amazing selection to choose from and their customer service is incredible. And the cherry on top, I have so much money by not using an overpriced landscaper. The experts at fast growing trees curate thousands of plants so you can find the perfect fit for your specific climate, location, and needs. You don't have to drive around town to nurseries and big gardening centers. Fast Growing Trees makes it easier to order online and your plants are shipped to your door in one to two days. Whether you're looking to add some privacy, shade, or natural beauty to your yard, Fast Growing Trees has in-house experts ready to help you make the right selection with growing and care advice available 24-7. You can talk to a plant expert about your soil type, landscape design, how to take care of your plants, and everything else you need. No green thumb required. Right now, they have the best deals online, up to half off on select plants. And listeners to our show get an additional 15% off when using the code MAJORITY at checkout. That's an additional 15% off at FastGrowingTrees.com using the code MAJORITY at checkout. FastGrowingTrees.com, code MAJORITY. Offer is valid for a limited time. Tell them we sent you. As you know, I'm married with kids. And candidly, finding the right life insurance to protect my family with Policy Genius has never been more important. Make life insurance part of your financial planning this year. Start shopping now with Policy Genius to find the right policy to protect your family. Getting life insurance today means you'll have peace of mind so that if something were to happen to you, your family can cover expenses while getting back on their feet. Luckily, Policy Genius helps you compare your options from top companies and their team of licensed experts is on hand to help talk you through it. I have life insurance and it's given me tremendous peace of mind. Policy Genius's technology makes it easier to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest price. Even if you already have a life insurance policy through work, it may not offer enough protection for your family's needs and it may not follow you if you leave your job. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for a million dollars of coverage. Some options offer same day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius has licensed award winning agents who can help you find the best fit for your needs. They work for you, not the insurance companies. That means they don't have an incentive to recommend one insurer over another, so you can trust their guidance. No wonder they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. Save time and money and provide your family with a financial safety net using Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com slash majority or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com slash majority. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. As I get older, I realize more and more that the relationships that I've cultivated with my dearest friends and family members are the most important relationships in my life. It hasn't always been an easy road, but with love, determination, and a lot of work, I've been able to become the best version of myself for me and for those closest to me. I've personally benefited from therapy myself. Therapy is helpful for learning positive coping skills and how to set boundaries. It empowers you to be the best version of yourself. Therapy isn't just for those who've experienced major trauma. It's for everyone because what you're going through matters. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. 
It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Become your own soulmate, whether you're looking for one or not. Visit BetterHelp.com slash M54 today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash M54. If you want what's going on behind the scenes during the commercial break, I'm me and Jay's are texting back and forth about the great sponsors. I'm like, oh man, I want a tree. <laughs> so, so I think we'll just go right into. So, if you saw it, the the craziest things going on, so Ronna McDaniel, uh, Ronna Romney McDaniel has said the rumors that she's going to step down after the South Carolina primary, and of course that starts the the campaign chaos. And it's come out this week. If you I don't know if we have any clips, but it came out this week that Trump wants to install his own like people to include Laura Trump as the co-chair of the RNC. So it would be, the idea is they're going to have a guy named Michael Watley, who's currently the North Carolina GOP chairman, has been accused of being a uh, an election denier, participating in all that process. And then Laura Trump is the co-chair and finally a, a create sort of a, a COO for Chris Lasavita, who is also on the Trump campaign and would dual hat. And the Laura Trump one is amazing. I mean, Laura, she graduated from like, what's it? Uh, you and Morrison, North Carolina, started off their comms program, ended up graduating, I think, with a pastry chef degree or something like that. I, I don't know. She went into like media for a while. In the end, she got married and that yeah, she's never run a large organization. She's never run a political organization, never run a political campaign. And she's already on TV this week saying that no more of this silly stuff like buying flowers for, you know, the, the, the big thing in the Republican Party right now, if you've seen it, Jason, is they've been really going crazy the fact that the RNC has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on flowers. Now, if you ever run a campaign or a party apparatus or frankly, any kind of organization, why would you spend money on flowers? Is it to decorate offices or is it for example, when a major donor spouse passes away, or right. there's a funeral, right? Or say a Senate, you see what I'm saying? The, the Republicans are going crazy about the flower budget. And I'm sitting back going, you know, that actually might be part of their fundraising budget. But, yeah. but Laura says, don't you worry. There's not going to be any more flowers. All the money from now on is going to go electing Donald Trump. You know what? So, I, I'll tell you this. I would believe and take at their word any member of the Trump family who promises not to send flowers when people die. <laughs> uh, I, I 100 percent believe <laughs> them and take them at their word. Uh, that's accurate. Yeah, yeah that's you know, you believe, right? It's not surprising to me that he wants to put Laura Trump there because, and I'm going to do the narcissistic thing where I quote myself. But <laughs> at the beginning of the Trump administration, when everybody was like, "Why is he hiring Jared Kushner? Why is he hiring Ivanka Trump? Why is he putting all these people?" I remember saying, and I, I say quote myself because I see this come back as a meme. It's like I see it a lot on social media and I get tagged, which is I, what I said at the time was gangsters don't hire family members for their qualifications. They hire them for their silence. And and that, I think, applies here as well, yeah. is you just want someone who won't yeah. talk to the FBI. <laughs> yeah, that's accurate. I think it's perfectly it's exactly it. And and to turn the RNC finally into truly nothing more than a campaign or a drunk ink. And look, he's going to have to spend a lot more money on law bills, <laughs> legal bills, right? I mean, he dropped with fifty million dollars last year on legal bills alone, and right. there's more of that coming. And 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 that leads to you know where we're going with that because it looks like Judge Engeron, Engeron, oh, forgive me, I'm you know <laughs> is expected. Right, it's hard to, to keep track of all these judges. I don't, man. I can't. There's so many. I think Engeron is supposed to. They're supposed to issue their ruling on Friday. He's gonna, which could be three hundred seventy million dollars. This is a huge issue, right? You, this has been coming for a while. I think we expected the verdict at the beginning of the month. Here we are, halfway through finally, and they say the court leaking where it says it's gonna be out Friday. This is a big one, and and a lot of people have been saying, hey. So if you guys aren't familiar, this is going to be that civil fraud case where they've been pumping up the numbers, their values, their properties to get loans and then lowering them to pay taxes. And the Letitia James is looking for basically they call the death penalty for their businesses, which would keep Donald Trump from doing any owning any businesses in New York, owning real estate in New York, buying real estate in New York uh, uh, for life, and then a shorter term, I believe, for the kids. Uh, the kids, you know, I do air quotes in that one. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have said to me, "Well, Fred, what's the big deal? He'll just re reincorporate in Florida." But for one nuance of this thing is that the the case you see, he already lost. <laughs> basically, this is the penalty phase. In that, they actually have someone overseeing the Trump family 
many businesses and they have to notify the court before they do anything. So the court has time to say, no, you can't do that. I think it's a mm. two weeks notice they purchase property now before the ruling, 30 days at the time, like re reorganize the business. So they're actually already down, sort of locked down what they can do. So it's not going to be as simple as just packing up and opening it back in Florida. So it's a very serious case. And look, $370 million is a lot of money, you know, by any standard. Yeah. So, you know, especially <laughs> I mean, when, Jesus. especially when you, nobody really knows if you have much money anymore. Uh, right. It, right. I mean, after a while it kind of adds up and yeah. uh, uh, it yeah. can add up to zero. That's uh, right. Is, 83 is, million is, to E. Jean Carroll, 5 million here, more there, you know, and, and that, that, that's why I think we tied this, this section together with the RNC takeover. I mean, mm -hmm. You know, yeah, because you know, he's going to need that money to pay the bills. Need that money. Uh, and I, now uh, we're a couple of days late on this, but we should at least touch on it before we wrap up here, which is the her report about Biden. Uh, I have my thoughts on what the dude was trying to do, but why don't you share yours first? Oh, I, I, I'm, I have stronger feelings probably, which is I just think it was completely a political hatchet job. I mean, you think about that, hundreds of pages all exonerate Biden in the end. He, he found no evidence. But the executive summary is the one getting all the press. And the executive summary, he'd like to highlight Biden's memory issues. I mean, look, there's no way on God's green earth he didn't know what that would do in the press. Exactly what was serving up on a platter for the Republican Party and for the political press and the far right press. Uh, that her is, is, as many people pointed out, a Trump uh, appointee. Uh, you know, he look, this is. I don't know. I just don't think it was an accident. And, and he got what he wanted. He got media attention. Now we find out, too, and if you heard that the Republicans are talking about bringing him in for hearings and they're, they're going to subpoena the actual transcripts of the interviews. I mean, he has handed them a, on a platter um, their mm -hmm. big issue against Mr. Biden. I, I don't know. I've been kind of frustrated. Yeah, I think it's that. And I think that's that's the most likely scenario. The best case scenario for what we could say about him is that Maybe he came to the legal conclusions, as he obviously did, that there was nothing there and was, frankly, afraid for his physical safety um, and just thought, I've got to do something to throw a bone out there that the far right will remember. And uh, and I just think it's it's truly like uh, I mean, it's 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 pretty incredible. And 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 it is. It's like Comey, except I will say for Comey, I don't think he knew what kind of fire he was playing with. Uh, it's it's at this point, you know exactly what you're doing. Um, exactly. And, you know, I said this week that if, if if I were advising Biden, what I would tell him to do whenever they bring this stuff up is I would say I would have him say, look, I get it. They want me to look old. That's their whole argument. I was a senior in high school when this guy was a freshman. We're the same age, and the difference between the two of us is yep. I don't wake up every day and get a ton of bronzer put on my face. I don't sit in a makeup chair for a half hour. I don't I don't have the time for a spray tan, and I don't have the time for like a dye job every every week because I'm busy getting shit done for America. So if that means that I and a guy who could have been my high school classmate don't look the same age. That's fine because when you do this job right, it physically ages you. But it it doesn't mean that I'm not doing the job well. And uh, and so I would just, you know, I th there's a fine line here because you've got to respond with indignance, but you can't respond with vanity, right? If you respond with indignance about yeah. the work that you're doing, that is appropriate. But if you respond with the vanity of someone who's being called old, then you just look like an old person who's not accepting their aging it reminds me it's kind of a charming story my grandfather my grandfather died in 2018 at the age of 95 um and when he was like 91 or 92 we had been talking to him about maybe maybe don't drive anymore you know maybe it's not safe and then one day uh, i remember <laughs> i had to go to the hospital because he had a little car wreck and the car wreck was he had driven straight through his garage door but oh man the thing was well, I, if I recall correctly, what had happened was um, he had uh, he had just forgotten that the garage door was down. And so he was backing out and he was and I was like, I got there and I was like, Pop, I think maybe this means don't drive anymore. And he goes, what are you talking about? He's like, I just forgot the garage door was down. He's like, if I had if I had not hit what I was aiming for, I think it'd be something to talk about. But I did exactly the car worked exactly the way I wanted it to, uh, which is a charming example of what we're talking about. And I don't, I'm not saying that's what Biden's doing, but I'm saying you don't want to come across that way. 
And so if yeah. you avoid if you avoid looking like you're being vain and you instead just say, like, look, I'm busy doing shit um, and point out that this guy goes to great lengths to not look the same age as me, even though we're the same age. And because what that does, as you and I know, is it suddenly plays into a bit of a maybe unfair toxic masculinity that exists in the universe of like, yeah. we don't have a whole lot of respect for people who spend an hour in the makeup chair every day if they're not a broadcaster or an actor. Right. Yep. And they're yep. and they're a dude, you know, so and I could ride a bike. Right. I mean, that, that, that's you know, right. joking. So at least if Biden can actually ride a bike, you know, <laughs> that's the thing. Right. It, it's just the difference. It, and it's frustrating. I had a guest on the show last week who said, you know, it's it's classic ageism. It's like one of the safe. It's one of the few yeah. things you can still be. You can still be a, an ageist and get away with it in America. It's one of the few stereotypes and, and, and isms you can get away with. And it's a good point. I mean, uh, the fact is, you know, and, and then you emphasize, OK, well, this I think he kind of said, joked about it. I was like, well, uh, look at this old guy. Look what I'm accomplishing. And that's in the end, that's the thing is uh, mm -hmm. for an old guy is getting a lot done. He's hired wonderful people. They're still in the jobs. We've had uh, only one single cabinet member is turned over. You know, it, it is. That kind of competency is what we were hoping to get when we we fought this battle three years ago to elect Mr. Biden or four years ago, and and we got it. We we got decency and competency. Um, would I like him to be younger? Yes. And I think uh, before we let everybody go, I think I saw a really interesting point somebody made the other day, and and, and I I it's hard to argue the point that is this really about Biden's age or Kamala Harris's skin tone? Right. And that's a. That's a hard question you yeah. got to answer, and, and it's a hard question that let's face it, be very very honest. Our own friends, the Democratic side of this equation, have to answer themselves: Is this yeah. really about Biden's age, or is this about Kamala Harris? And I, that's a troubling question nobody wants to uh, really deal with, but I think we have to. Yeah, if Gavin Newsom were vice president, it may not be as much of an issue. And I'm not. That's I, not a knock on Kamala. That's uh, no. That's pointing out that race is a factor here, and and gender, totally and gender, um, and gender, and gender. I agree. Uh, and by the way, like, it's actually sort of an apples to apples comparison other than race and gender, right? I mean, they're, they're two statewide officials prior to their vice yeah. presidency, two statewide officials from California. Yep. Um, so, okay. Uh, with, with all that, you have a grab an oar before we go. I do. Well, my own organization, I'm going to plug my own organization. So I'm yeah. proud to be the national chairman. I mentioned on my show quite a bit, a organization called Forgotten Democrats. And Forgotten Democrats is really unique. It's it's not a big super PAC. We don't have like any staff. There's a couple of us. And we've got a unique uh, fiscal earmark that allows us to collect our donors. And then the, the money that our donors give us is given directly to candidates, Democratic nominees for the House that need the money first, those who haven't been able to raise enough money. Last cycle, uh, some 26 Republicans ran unopposed, 123 ran with an opponent that never even raised $200,000. So the idea for Forgotten Dems is a very simple one. Our, you become a member, you participate in events, you give money monthly, and that money is directly distributed to candidates without our fingerprints even touching it. It's not. There's no questionnaires the candidate has to fill out. If they're the Democratic nominee and they meet a certain threshold of their financial raising, they'll get some money from us. This is our first cycle. Um, we're just growing right now. We've got a town hall coming up, but you can learn more at ForgottenDemocrats.org. And an easy way to join, uh, just getting our email list, is you text FRED to 33777. That's FRED, my name, F-R-E-D. To three three seven seven, but I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's a, we do some fun stuff. We have some town halls, uh, but it's a unique little project that I'm proud to sort of serve as the face. <laughs> so thanks for awesome. plug it. Uh, yeah. yeah, and one plug one more thing uh, or two more things. Plug your podcast one more time, and also yes. let people know where to find you on social media. I'll do it. So my show, of course, is On to Mox, the FP Wellman, right here in the Minus Touch Network. We broadcast new shows. We actually we recorded ahead of time. It goes up Friday nights at 11. We're the, we're the weekend show, if you will, a Friday night show on the Minus Touch Network. We've got a growing audience. Talk to cool people about what's happening in our democracy. Uh, we've got some great guests coming up. I'm excited. Hey, I got I got Trey Crowder, the liberal redneck, coming on next uh, yeah. week. <laughs> so I got to really – here like, He was on here like oh, he's three great. years ago, and uh, oh, he was so great. great, man. That was before – He's huge really now. He's doing a tour. Yeah, got a book show, right? and yeah. the, I had Christopher Titus on. I think I laughed so hard I couldn't even keep straight. So uh, the show is great. I can honor my FP Wellman. You can find me on social media as at FP Wellman, or you can find me at FP Wellman official on Instagram and threads. We're growing there, uh, at least right now. So I really appreciate this. Man, it's great hanging out with you. I appreciate you letting yeah. me step in for your partner in crime. Yeah, thank you very much for doing this. Um, you know, for those who have stuck with us this long in the show, Ravi uh, is in India on a reporting project. Um, Fred was nice enough to not only step in in Ravi's place, but to do all the work this week because um, I have now made it to the end of this show. But I, this is the first thing that I have done 
uh, really at all in the last three days because we, you know, the Chiefs won the Super Bowl on Sunday night and it was great. And then I woke up on Monday morning. I didn't, I, I didn't even have a drink. It wasn't that. I, I woke up on Monday morning and I had norovirus, uh, which my, and so did my son, so did my daughter. So my poor wife had to take care of all of us. Honestly, this morning is the first time I've been able to get out of bed. And I've been nauseous this whole time. We started this show by me saying to Fred and, the, and our producers, if you see me leave frame, it's because I'm throwing up. So just stick with Fred for a while. So I'm going back to sleep. Uh, so thank you, Fred, for coming in and, and saving our day here. So I appreciate it very, very much. Um, thank you to uh, the Midas Mighty. Thank you to Patrick Mahomes for existing uh, and, yeah. and the Kansas City Chiefs generally. Um, you can find me at Jason Kander on everything. Uh, but remember, we all have a platform. Make sure to use yours today.